Hello everybody, I am Brother Luke. Uh, I am going to attempt to explain my um, viewpoint on how we should um, undertake the study of the Bible and the, the interpretive lens that we need to wear as we study it. Uh, I, I just started a new playlist and it's talking about dispensationalism and covenant theology. These are the two really common uh, methods uh, or philosophies about how to interpret the Bible. And I, I've collected a lot of videos on each of those subjects. I've studied them and, and I, I have them collected. So you can watch them, learn about these things and um, see if there's any merit in, in anything that's said there. But I'm gonna make a presentation now on what I, I believe is the correct way to approach this. Um, Sister Renee, you've probably heard her often say that when you read the Bible, you need to put on your grace goggles. So in other words, you look through the lens of grace as you go through the Bible, so you have that as your interpretive lens. Well, um, so let's call this, this video here, um, Grace from Garden to Garden. And I, I believe that, that God has always had a a pres progressive revelation of grace, a, a progressive revelation or dispensation of God's plan of salvation. Uh, from the beginning to the end, salvation has been taught the same way, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, now, you may have heard it said that um, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Uh, I, I think that's a beautiful way of stating it. It's, I think it's a, it's a profound truth. Uh, I wish I had uh, invented the saying, but um, uh, uh, let's examine that way of thinking. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. That means as you read the Old Testament, you're really seeing the New Testament message in there, but it's it's not um, explicitly stated as as we would state it today. It's it's a more obscured. Uh, it it appears in the form of prophecies, shadows, types, pictures. These are the theological terms. Uh, I don't want to define each one of them now, but but basically, it's saying that. Um, you, you really won't understand it at the time because it's not it's stated explicitly, but looking at back at it in hindsight, we clearly should understand the meaning of these prophecies, pictures, shadows, and types. Uh, let me make you, ask you to think a little bit. Uh, have you ever watched a movie or uh, read a book and it, it did not make sense? Uh, it was confusing until the very end. Uh, when the plot twist was uh, finally revealed. If we go back and watch that same movie again, then we really get it. And it all makes perfect sense. Um, and, it, and in the Bible, uh, the, the same thing is happening. It, it's almost as if the characters in the Old Testament are acting out a play the meaning of which they are completely unaware. Uh, it is only the audience of the play, those who watch in light of solid knowledge of the New Testament, who understand the meaning of the words and events in this play. That quotation is, um, I would say it's 99% correct. The only way I, way I would change it is that it says that uh, the meaning of which they are completely unaware. In other words, in the Old Testament, as everything's happening, they were completely unaware of the significance of it. I, I wouldn't say they're completely unaware. Uh, they understand some, some meaning, but not as clearly as we do now in hindsight. Uh, so um, to put it more simply, the, the theme of the Old Testament is the Messiah is coming, bringing salvation. The theme of the New Testament 
is the Messiah is here bringing salvation. Um, so you probably heard it said that in the Old Testament, uh, the, the salvation uh, was achieved by having faith that God would provide a savior uh, in the future, faith in the coming savior. Uh, and, and now we look back and, and say, God has provided the savior. It's Jesus Christ. And we know not only who he is, but we know exactly how it was all accomplished. Uh, we have all the, the details, but throughout the Old Testament, there were only a lot of clues. So uh, there, there are, it might surprise you, uh, from Genesis all the way through Malachi, there are 365 prophecies uh, about the future uh, uh, Messiah, Savior, uh, about the person, and, and about oh, the plan of salvation. In 365 prophecies, detailed information that we have, that were written uh, hundreds and even thousands of years before Jesus appeared on the scene. Uh, I have a list of all of them I'll provide to anybody who, who wants to have a list of all these prophecies. Um, so these things were revealed to us in the past through these prophecies, but the prophecies had to be interpreted and, and it wasn't so clear and explicit. But we can look back at the prophecies now in hindsight and we, we can under, interpret what the actual, the intended meaning was. Um, also, there's a, the idea of um, pictures and shadows in the Old Testament. Uh, I, I won't do, try to define that either now, but the, uh, I have a playlist titled The Bloody Trail. And uh, it, it's a quite a lengthy uh, series of videos talking about uh, all the pictures and shadows in the Old Testament, uh, pictures of the future uh, shed blood of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Um, so uh, some of those I will reference as I go forward in this uh, talk today. Uh, so I hope you will watch the series, The Bloody Trail. Uh, and if you'd like, I'll send you the 365 prophecies so that you'll see that uh, these shadows and these prophecies, uh, it was all there. Everything was all there throughout the Old Testament. It was gradually dispensed, it was gradually revealed, progressive revelation of this truth. Uh, so it brings us to the also a, a question is well what part does the the mosaic law play in all of this um, or, or the 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 old covenant uh, the phrase the old covenant the the, the agreement with uh, Israel um, God's agreement with Israel his covenant with Israel the old covenant what, what about uh, uh, what's the purpose of that legal system that was given from Moses to, to Israel? Well, first of all, uh, all the laws of Moses, they were never given to Israel uh, as, a, as a solution to the sin problem so that their sins could be forgiven and they could be with God and have eternal life. It was never the intention of these laws. The laws were, were given to Israel because a nation needs laws. Every nation today has a set of laws, uh, a legal system. Also, uh, some of the laws were uh, explaining how the sacrificial system should be done. And, and the sacrificial system is another picture in, uh, of the future blood sacrifice that Jesus would would make for us. Um, the, um, the other purpose of the Mosaic Laws is the, the moral law, the, the Decagogue, the Ten Commandments, uh, and that is just the, the moral laws to, uh, expect, this is what is expected of the people so that we have a moral society, some kind of moral uh, code to, uh, for accountability. Uh, but but all of this was not intended as a as a 
system of uh, do's and don'ts so that you can uh, earn your salvation with good behavior. Uh, that's a, that's a false misunderstanding, and and that was not the original intent of the law, but unfortunately, it, uh, there was a time where much of Israel thought that was the proper use of the law, that they could earn their their salvation uh, by following the laws of Moses. Uh, there's another uh, phrase that's important for us to understand. The dispensationalists, more so than any other group, they take the term rightly divide, the word of truth. And I believe they've hijacked that for themselves and think, and they proclaim that they are the right dividers. But what they've really done uh, is um, by not understanding the word divide, uh, and by the way, that's the King James translation, divide. Most other translations would phrase it as rightly handle the Word of God, or rightly interpret and rightly apply the Word of God, not divide it. But they, they say rightly divide it, and they take that to mean that you divide it. The, the history that we find in the Old Testament, uh, all of that is divided into epics or you know, periods of history where God had a different set of rules of how he's going to deal with people. And some dispensationalists think that these are all actually different methods for people to attain salvation. So various uh, salvation gospel messages. Uh, so uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, we, what is, I, I believe that the right way of understanding that is that when we come across a verse that um, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what is the subject here? What is the context? Is it talking about uh, salvation, being saved from uh, uh, the uh, uh, consequences the, of our sin? Is it talking about getting forgiveness of sin so that we don't have to suffer the second death in the lake of fire? Is it talking about that and, and, and uh, the gift of eternal life? Or is it talking about uh, discipleship, how to follow the Lord's example? Uh, or is it talking about service, how to serve the church and, and, and your brother? Uh, is it talking about ministry, how, how you fit into the body of Christ, what role do you play? Is it talking about the, the reward system that Jesus and Paul talked about, building your treasures in heaven? Uh, uh, or, or is it talking about salvation? And uh, it, let, we, we need to discern that because salvation uh, is, is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So if there's a verse that it is talking about doing some kind of work, then it cannot be talking about salvation. It has to be talking about discipleship, service, ministry, or rewards. Okay, so now let's look at, uh, go through the Bible a little bit so I can um, further make this case. Uh, let's look at Genesis 1.26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all uh, the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So here we see God say in Genesis 1.26, the 26th verse of the Bible, he says that God has made, uh, not only made God man in God's image, but everything, all of creation, the earth and everything that's in it, is made for man. God made all this for man to rule over. So, uh, this is the first indication that God's intention here is to provide for mankind. We can, have you ever thought about that the air we breathe is, that was provided by God. All the food, the various types of foods that we eat, all that is here only because God has provided it. Well, he provided a place for us to live. Uh, uh, 
and God, when it after the fall in the garden, and, and now man and God are estranged uh, because of the fall, God also provided a means of reconciliation uh, so that we can get back in good standing with God and, and have the, uh, the intended relationship that God always wanted with us. Uh, so you can see that God really uh, wants to be the provider for mankind. Let's look at uh, chapter 2, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So uh, it, it says all these trees are good for you to eat, uh, and also there's the tree of life, and then there's another tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and the tree of life is another example of pictures and shadows. It would be a picture of Jesus Christ because Jesus is life. Jesus is the sole source of life everlasting. He proved that when he said, after they kill me, I'll raise myself back alive, proving my claims are true that I am God, I am the promised Savior, I do have power over life and death, and he proved it with his resurrection. Uh, so he is the source of life, and he was nailed to the tree, and in that way you can see the cross, uh, he, that he is a picture of the tree of life in the garden. That, was, that would be a, a, represent, a source of eternal life, the tree of life, and Jesus is the actual source of eternal life. Uh, and then you also have the other tree in the garden that uh, called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why, why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there in the midst? Uh, he did warn Adam and Eve, or at least he warned Adam, and then Adam told Eve about it. But uh, he, he said, that tree will kill you. So basically... It's like your parent teaching you about, oh, that, that particular food there, that's poisonous. Don't eat that. It's poisonous. Well, so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was poisonous, and if man ate it, he would die that very day. Uh, so why did God put that there? Um, you know, it, it, the Bible says that God is love. God is love. That is the essence of God. Um, and, and, and love is, is not only a noun, but it's a verb. It's, it's, love is what love does. And so um, God wants to love us, but he wants us to love him back. But love cannot be imposed on someone. In other words, God can't make us love him. We have to, uh, of our own accord, uh, fall in love with God. And rather, rather than uh, if God forces us to love him, it's, it's, it's a false form of love. And so God wants a true love relationship with his creation. And, and so that means that all of his creation uh, has to have a, an opportunity to either embrace God and say, I love you. It, it, the scripture says that we love him because he first loved us. <clears throat> so when we understand how much Jesus loves us, our, our response should be, I love him back, because that's exactly the experience, by the way, that I had when I first got saved, when I understood how much Jesus loved me. He said, there's no greater love than being willing to give your life for a friend. Jesus is willing to give his life for me. And I loved him. But it was my choice. I could love him and embrace him as my savior. Or I could reject him entirely and walk away and go my own way. And this is, this is a choice that everybody has today. But Adam and Eve had to also have a choice to make. And that's why that tree was there in the garden. That was there so that Adam and Eve could freely choose to say, no, I, uh, I, I want to um, 
well, let me go forward. He says, um, they, they could eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, but that means they have knowledge of right and wrong. And when, you have, when they understand exactly what right and wrong is, uh, then everything they do uh, will be judged as either right or wrong. Uh, and and uh, so they, the question is, will they trust Jesus or will they trust their own judgment by law keeping? In other words, well, again, God's desire is to provide everything for us. Um, a, a, by providing for us, it's, it, we're understanding that we need God. We don't, we don't, I made a video a few years ago titled, um, um, Declaration of Dependence. N not Declaration of Independence, but Declaration of Dependence. Um, we need to reach a point where we uh, understand and, and embrace the idea that I need to depend on God. If you haven't ever thought about this, we are all depending on God to provide us the essentials of life. Air, water, food, environment. Uh, but God knows also we need to depend on Him for uh, the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. Um, he, he wants us to, to trust him for all these things. Let him be the provider in every way, any, uh, even the provider of our salvation. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 16 in chapter 2 of Genesis. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, so as I said, he's saying that if you eat of that tree, it's going to kill you. You'll die that very day. Now the interesting thing is that the Bible says that uh, the day that they ate of, ate of it, um, God withdrew from them. They became estranged. God withdrew his spirit from them that he breathed into them. Um, and, and, and then at the fall, the Spirit of God withdrew from them. So now, rather than being triune beings, uh, body, soul, and spirit, it made as an image of the triune God. Now, they're incomplete people. They're body and soul, but the spirit has withdrawn, so they have a dead spirit. And this is the way Adam and Eve existed after the fall. This is all of the descendants of Adam and Eve, you and I. We're all born from our mother's womb as an incomplete people. We, we have functioning bodies, functioning minds, souls, uh, which is our, our consciousness, our identity. Uh, but our spirits are dead and they need to be brought to life. We were born wrong. And th therefore there's a need to be born again. And when we're born again, the, putting our faith in Jesus as our Savior, the, the Holy Spirit of God comes and enters us and connects to us. Now we're connected to God. And it, it's, it's the first resurrection. It's the resurrection of our spirit. Our spirit's brought to life. The Bible says we're quickened. Uh, so you can see that because of the fall, we have a, a problem that needs to be fixed. We need to be born again. And, and, and oh, we get born again by believing in Jesus as our Savior. Uh, but he said, uh, if you eat of that tree, you'll die that day. They did die that day spiritually because it was a spiritual death. Uh, and that's why and Paul wrote about that uh, we are all spiritually dead and uh, that's why we need to be have our spirit quickened, brought, brought to life. Uh, uh, but they didn't actually die physically. Death entered them, and, and that, that meant that they would not remain young and healthy. Uh, they would gradually grow old, get sick, and eventually die. 
Uh, it took about eight or nine hundred years for them to die. At the beginning, humanity lived a long time, and over time, the effect of the fall, I believe, was um, gradually became more and more of a, an effect in our lifespan. Uh, now, let's look at chapter 3, verse 1 in Genesis. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Uh, so, you know, she's not quoting God exactly right. He said, if you eat of it, you'll die. He didn't say anything about touching it. She expounded that. That's that she added to the word of God. Um, so that leads me and others to believe that um, God said this to Adam before Eve was created. Uh, and, and then Adam had to teach Eve, and Eve didn't under, understand it completely. But she knew that if they eat of the tree, that they would die. But she said, even if she even said, if you even touch it, you'll die. Um, but the serpent said, in verse 4, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Wow. There's a problem here. God says that you will surely die. The serpent, the devil, says you will not surely die. So who's right? Well, uh, this is the, this is the first sin I believe is that is that uh, they had to they should be believe God. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to believe Him. But instead, does she believe God, or does she believe the devil instead? Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he says something that's really very tempting to Eve. Uh, he says, it's not true that you'll die by eating that. What will actually happen is that your eyes will be opened, and you'll understand good and evil, and you will be as gods. Well, they already had a God. God Almighty is their God. And that's why God, they, God made them, so that they could have this relationship, God and man, uh, this love relationship between the two. But, again, that tree, that knowledge, the tree of knowledge is there to, to give them a choice of, of um, choosing God or choosing something else. And, and she did not believe God. She believed the devil. And she must have been very enticed by this, this offer. Wait, you mean I can become a God myself? I can be my own God? And when the woman saw, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So it seems to me that Adam was there as this conversation was going on, but he's directing the, the devil's directing the conversation to the woman, but Adam probably is right there next to her listening. And so she eats, and then also Adam ate. And by eating, what they did was they, they embraced the idea that they would become gods themselves. They would be their own gods. No need for God Almighty who created them and everything that they have. The whole world is theirs. No need for that God that loved them and made them. That they Now they've decided to be their own gods. Uh, and all God really wants for them is he wants to have them to let him be God. Don't be your own God. Um, but 
This was, in a way, man's declaration of independence from God by saying, God's a liar. The devil is telling me the truth. I won't surely die. I'll become a God myself. And then eating of that, uh, that was their statement saying, I'm free from God. I'm independent. I'm my own God. Let's look at Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is one of the prophecies that uh, I mentioned earlier, 365 prophecies in the Old Testament talking about uh, the, the, the future Savior, who he was, and, and how he would save us. And in here, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Instead of being there with God, we've gone off our own way. And that's what they did. They said, I, I want independence from God. I want to go do my own thing. I want to be my own God. I want to make my own judgments. I know good and evil. I know right and wrong. I'm qualified to lead my own life now. And of course, uh, this fall that they went through because of this rebellion, this rejection of God, they, uh, that's affected them genetically. And as they reproduced, this genetic disorder, this uh, mutation, malfunction, is passed on through us genetically so that we're all born wrong too. We're born two-thirds of a person without a living soul, I mean, without a living spirit, and we're, we're born with, a, with mortality. That means they're going to die at some point. Everybody knows. How old were you? when uh, someone told you that someday you're going to die because everybody dies someday. You might have been five, six, eight, ten. some point, all of us were confronted with this hard truth. And so we wouldn't have had to face this death sentence if it wasn't for Adam and Eve. That was passed on genetically through all of us, their descendants. Um, so what, what God really wants us to do is uh, let him be God, let him shower his love on us, let him provide everything for us. And now that they're estranged, they've, they've uh, left God to go their own way. God says, okay, uh, you can come back. Uh, I'll prepare a way, a, a bridge for you to come back uh, so that uh, we can restore our relationship. Uh, but you need me. You need to trust me in this way. You can't do it. You cannot restore the relationship yourself. You need to let me do it for you. Just like I provided everything else, God says, I will provide salvation for you. Um, so, uh, the, um, a lot of people say that in um, Genesis 3.15 is the first indication of God's plan of salvation. But I think everything I've said so far is, is also an indication of oh, God's plan. God knew in advance. Don't you think God knew in advance that, uh, one, he had to give them that choice to eat of that tree or not eat of it? O only in that way could you have a real love relationship. And, and today, you watching now, if you've never believed on Jesus as your Savior and received eternal life as a gift. If you've never done that, you have the choice to make. Either you can say, I don't need him, I'm going to go my own way, or you can say, I need Jesus as my Savior, and you can embrace him and receive eternal life. Everybody has to make a choice to love and receive Jesus, or to reject Jesus and go their own way. Uh, but in Genesis 3.15, many people think this is the beginning of the gospel. Uh, it, it, it certainly is um, um, a vague um, uh, shadow. As I said, things are presented in shadows and types and pictures. Uh, these are theological terms, but it just means that it's not explicitly stated. We have to try to understand it. It's symbolic. Uh, 
And I will put, God said to the serpent at this point, he says to the devil, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between the serpent and the woman. He's putting enmity, uh, a, 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 a conflict between them. There's conflict. And, and between thy seed, the devil, between your seed, your offspring, uh, and her seed, her offspring, uh, not Eve herself. Some people believe that when they had Cain and Abel, that uh, uh, one of them was supposed to be the, the savior. But we know now that no, uh, the, this was a descendant way down the road of genealogy that uh, would be the savior, that's Jesus. But uh, uh, it says, thy seed and her seed, it, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise, bruise his heel. So, um, so he's saying that the devil, you're gonna bruise the heel of the, the, the woman's seed. Bruising the heel is a minor thing. Bruising the head is a serious thing. I think some translations say crush the head rather than bruise the head. But this is the first prophecy of the, the conflict in the future where the descendant of Eve, there will be a, a savior produced that will uh, be in a conflict with the devil, but the savior will win. Now his, his heel is bruised, meaning well, that's just a temporary problem. Uh, and his death on the cross, that was a temporary problem. He, after three days, he raised himself from the dead. Um, so he, he, he showed that he had the victory. Jesus had the victory. He showed that he has power over life and death. He is the source of life. Um, so uh, man is, is trying to be independent and, and solve the problem himself, but um, we need God to provide everything for us. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the place we live, and now we need him to provide uh, for us a means of reconciliation, reconciliation or salvation. Look at verse seven, uh, it says, and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You see, um, they recognize their nakedness at this point. Now they, they weren't clothed before that. They were walking around naked and thought nothing of it. But after the fall, their nakedness made, they felt awkward. They, they felt self-conscious of it. They felt something was wrong. They felt there was a need to be covered. But rather than going to God and say, God, help help us, they tried to solve the problem themselves again. Now they're independent from God, so they have to, they think that we can fix the problem. Well, they happened to be next to a fig tree for some reason. Perhaps that was the original fruit that was forbidden to eat. Some speculate that. But they took the leaves of the fig tree, sewed them together, and made a covering for their bodies. The first clothing. Uh, but uh, in verse 21 it says, Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. See, at this point God saw, look, they're, they're trying to uh, solve the problem of their sin, their nakedness. Uh, now that they're aware of that, their nakedness, uh, they're trying to solve it themselves by making clothing. But th there's only one clothing or covering that will really solve the problem. And, and, and it requires death and shed blood. So God provides them with coats of skins. Now, God could create, he could just boom, all of a sudden have coats of skin appear out of nowhere, uh, like he made the fishes and loaves appear. But uh, I think in this case, God caused the death of the animal, the shed blood of the animal, uh, 
and took the animal skins to, and provided a covering for them. Now, he wanted them to understand that in order to solve this problem, death and shed blood was necessary now. Uh, so this is also a picture or shadow of the future s solution to our sin problem, the shed blood and death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, if we look at chapter 4, verse 3, it says, And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And, and the Lord uh, had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So Cain offered God the his the the fruit from his labor he worked hard worked at the land produced a, some kind of a crop and, and offered some of the crop to the Lord so it was a work system and God was not pleased with it but um, Abel's offering was <clears throat> the uh, first laying of his flock and and the fat thereof. So he did an offering the firstling of the flock as a living lamb. Uh, he, he offered him the fat thereof. You can't offer the fat of the animal unless you kill the animal, removing, removing the fat. So Abel offered a, uh, a blood sacrifice, and God was pleased with that because this was also another picture of what was going to be necessary in the future, the death and shed blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our, our Savior. Uh, verse 5 says, But unto Cain and his offering he had no respect, and Cain was very wrought, and his countenance fell. And we know what happened after that. Cain ended up slaying his brother. Now let's look at uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with a faithful Abraham. So, um, I, I'm, I'm, Paul is giving this account of Abraham and, and God. Um, so much more could be said about Abraham and everything that in that story. Um, but Paul is telling us here that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Now, uh, did Abraham, uh, well, did he, was he preached and did he understand the gospel as I do right now and you do? That this savior for the world would not only be your offspring in your genealogical family tree, a descendant of yours, Abraham, but his name is Jesus, he's gonna be Jesus born in Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth, and he will be crucified. That crucifixion didn't exist back then, so he's going to be nailed hands and feet to a cross and suffer a horrible death to pay for the sins of the world. And he'll be raised from the dead, showing he has victory over life and death. Uh, did, did God explain it to, to Abraham in that way? Perhaps. It says... For seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. This is Paul saying the gospel. And Paul, Paul knows the gospel. The gospel he preached, it sounds to me like Paul is saying the gospel that I'm preaching, this very gospel was preached to Abraham. Uh, but regardless, the scripture tells us that, uh, that uh, a, a, God made Abraham a promise that, that through him, through his descendants, uh, this 
Savior would come, this Messiah, uh, and, and that all the nations of the world would be blessed through that. Uh, uh, and I, how much did Abraham understand the, the, the significance of all that at the time? I don't, I don't know. But we do know that Abraham believed God. And the scripture says, because Abraham believed God's promise, God declared Abraham righteous and in good standing because his, of his faith that, that God would keep that promise. That's what God wants us to do. God wants to believe that he is faithful to keep the promises he, make, he made to us in the, in the scriptures. Look at verse 15. It said, Paul wrote, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Um, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, uh, this is a reference to a the the covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son. Uh, that's the, the that was made before all of creation. God made an agreement within within Himself about all of this. That uh, uh, this is the plan. This we God knows knew everything that was going to happen. Um, so God had a plan for uh, redemption of man and it was agreed upon and a promise made between the father and the son so this is a promise that the father made to the son and the point is that uh, it's, it's not a promise to you and me it's a promise to Jesus Christ but because we believe into Christ that's what we when we believe in Jesus we're believing into Jesus that's what the scripture says, that we are in Christ through faith. So because we are in Christ, we are already seated in heavenly places right now. As Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, we are there with him because we're in Christ. Uh, so here we see that uh, the gospel, um, there are shadows made in the garden uh, with, uh, that I've cited, a couple of uh, things that are pictures of how God's going to accomplish the uh, salvation for man. It requires shed blood and death. Uh, and now we say that at, God actually told Abraham the gospel and explained it all to, to, to him. So we can see, I want you to understand that the gospel started at the very beginning in the garden. The good news that God, I want to be your God. I want to provide everything for you. There's a tree there that you, you could eat of it if you if, if you choose to eat of it. You're free to eat of it. But it's poisonous. You'll die. Uh, don't eat of it. And, and so that, that gave, put them in a position where they could choose, choose to believe God or not. Uh, choose to uh, uh, love and embrace God as their God or choose to become their own gods and go their own way. Uh, so all these things are part of the gospel message that are ex explained in vague ways, in shadows. Um, let's look at Romans 2.28. It says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So, uh, here, there's much more that Paul wrote about this, but clearly we see, and also from the words of Jesus, when Jesus said that the, uh, the, the, the vine, that br certain branches will be cut off and others grafted in, but those that were cut off, can, they can come back and be grafted back in again, 
it shows that it's not the genetic line of, of, of Jews that's, that matters. Uh, it, you, when you, when you get grafted in by faith in God's plan and his Savior, when you, when you believe that, you're grafted in. So there is, there is no need for, to, to think that the actual land and nation of Israel and the genetic line of the descendants are uh, a separate from group of people than, than us, the, the church, the believers, that we're, we're all united into this one vine, which is Jesus. Um, so the, the true Jew, according to Paul, is not one outwardly that has a genetic connection, but the true Jew is, is someone who is spiritually connected as a Jew. Uh, this is one of the distinctions in dispensationalism, is that most forms of dispensationalism, they, they make a distinction between Israel and the church, and God, God thinks of them as two separate groups, and he has two separate distinct plans for them. But Paul says here and, and elsewhere, no, God's finished with Israel. Uh, now it, God's plan is that we're all one. There's no Jew and Gentile any longer. Uh, so uh, I have 365 uh, prophecies uh, that are that show the prophecy that was uh, made in the Old Testament, all the way from Genesis all the way through Malachi. Uh, and then it not only does it show the prophecy that was made, the prediction about the future, but it shows you uh, in the New Testament the chapter and verse where that particular prophecy was fulfilled. And all of these prophecies are about the future uh, Savior, the plan of salvation, who the Savior would be, and how the Savior would accomplish salvation. So this gospel message is clearly laced, uh, a, a bloody thread, a bloody trail throughout the entire uh, scriptures uh, of God's plan uh, of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the uh, plan of salvation. So the important thing I think for us to understand is that um, if you watch the videos on my playlist here about dispensationalism and the videos about covenant theology, it's all very interesting, but I, I, I think they both got it wrong. They're both wrong in a lot of ways. And this is how I see it. Uh, I believe that um, in progressive revelation that God has dispensing God has been dispensing more and more information, revealing re revelation gradually, more and more details throughout all the Bible. But now we have all the facts. It's all quite clear to us it's, it, it, because it's, it's finished, as Jesus said. So we know exactly what God's plan was and then it was accomplished by Jesus. But back in the earlier parts of the Bible, these things were pictures and shadows. So um, they, they had to just trust that God had a plan uh, for their redemption, and they needed to trust God, and gradually God revealed more details of the plan. So it's progressive revelation. And that progressive revelation didn't just progress gradually through the Old Testament. Even in the New Testament, it, did, it wasn't clearly stated, even when Jesus was telling his apostles, Scripture says that, but they didn't understand it. He says, he says uh, I'm going someplace you can't come with me. Where are, we, where are you going, Lord? And, and he says, I'm going to be crucified, but I'll raise myself from the dead. And they kind of went in one ear and out the other ear. Well, maybe it had to, because they, they would have, and others would have tried to prevent him, prevent it from happening, as Peter said, I won't let that happen. Um, and and uh, if, if Jesus uh, allowed the Jewish people to really get behind him and proclaim him as king, uh, th then this couldn't have happened. He had to, he had to orchestrate things in a way so that they, uh, 
he had to die. That's why he came. He said, do not think I came to be served, but rather to serve. And he gave us all kinds of examples of serving, washing the feet of his apostles, showing us how to be a humble servant. Uh, and he says, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he says, that's why he came down from heaven. He had to become a man in order to die because God cannot die. And death was required. It's either ours or he would die in our place. Now I'm talking about the, uh, we, 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 we do die, but our, di our deaths are all temporary because we're gonna get a resurrection to life everlasting. The lost people get resurrected to the judgment where they find that they, they never received the gift of eternal life from Jesus, so they perish the second death. Um, okay, uh, that's the, uh, I guess, uh, I, I can't urge you enough to watch the, uh, the playlist I have, The Bloody Trail. Go, go, I think you'll really be blessed and really enjoy it. But I, I gave you examples of a, a, just a couple, of, a handful of the pictures and shadows. But there's so many in the Old Testament. Uh, so it's important, I think, for us to all understand that, look, uh, th there was never a system of, of working for salvation in the Old T Testament. There's not going to be some future dispensation where people are not saved by faith, but they have to be do works also. No. Uh, from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Eden in the future when we have everything's restored. If you didn't know it, God says that there's going to come a day when Jesus returns and he destroys everything and he gives us a new heaven and a new earth. And it'll be uh, the Garden of Eden 2.0. And, and, and from the first garden to the future garden, it's always been God's plan that... Uh, we're, we're, we have grace uh, progressively revealed, progressive revelation of grace throughout the whole Bible. All of this is done for us, not because we earned it or we deserve it, only because God loves us and he's so gracious. He wants to do these wonderful things for us. He gave you life. He gave you uh, a sustenance, everything you need to keep living and, and uh and now he's given you a means of restoring your relationship with God and being able to live forever on the new heaven and new earth. All right, I appreciate everybody uh, watching. Uh, I hope you will watch all the videos on this playlist uh, because I haven't gone into great deal explaining dispensationalism and new covenant theology. Uh, I'm leaving it up to all the other videos on the playlist to explain exactly what it all is and, and uh, the potential problems with those things. So I, I, I believe that um, the progressive revelation uh, of the grace of God and, and re reading the Bible, studying it with that lens to, through these grace goggles, uh, that's the appropriate approach to take to studying the Bible. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.